So I'm here to welcome you all to the Division 15 Presidential Talk. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Gail Sinatra, who is our past president and is leaving this exciting and important job. Uh, Gail Sinatra is the Stephen H. Proctor Professor of Psychology and Education at the University of Southern California's Rossier School of Education. She serves as an associate editor of the APA Journal Psychological Bulletin. She is a fellow of APA, the American Educational Research Association, the Society for Text and Discourse. She supervises the Motivated Change Research Lab. The mission of the lab is understanding the cognitive, motivational, and emotional processes that lead to attitude change, conceptual change, and successful learning, particularly in STEM. Her areas of expertise include climate science education, evolution education, STEM learning, conceptual change learning, and the public understanding of science. Her work has been cited thousands of times by scholars in psychology, education, and, the, and science teaching and learning. Today, Gail is giving her Division 15 presidential address. Thus, I want to highlight her service to Division 15. Um, I I'm sorry, I want to highlight that her service to Division 15 did not start with her presidency. Here's a quick timeline of Gail's work in Division 15. 2004, she was the program co-chair. 2005 to 2010, she was editor of our journal, Educational Psychologist. 2007, she was named a Division Fellow. This means she could be asked to do more work. 2007, she also presented at the Graduate Student Seminar and reviewed proposals for us. 2016, she became chair of our Career Achievement Award Committee. Uh, she also became our representative to the APA Coalition for Psychology in the Schools. 2017, she was president-elect. 2018, she served as president. And now 2019, she is ending her term as past president. Gail, I think there are still a few committees you haven't chaired and positions on the EC you can still run for. Don't think we're letting you get away from us. On behalf of the EC, committee chairs and our members, I thank you for your enduring service and leadership to Division 15. I am now pleased to turn this over to Gail. Her talk is entitled, Why Deny? A Journey into the Psychology of Public Misunderstanding of Science. Thank you everybody for joining me under these unique circumstances for my presidential address. I'm honored to be here with you and I'm excited to get started. The title of my presentation is Why Deny? A Journey into the Psychology of Public Misunderstanding of Science. I'm gonna begin by taking you through a journey of my research from my text literacy research to how I got to science literacy research. And then I'm going to talk about my conceptual change model and how we explored warm change about hot topics. But for the most of my presentation, I'm going to focus on my forthcoming volume with Barbara Hofer about science denial. So in the early 1990s, I was a new assistant professor at the University of Utah. And for a text processing study, I chose the topic of human evolution. And I was really surprised that acceptance, not comprehension, was the major issue. And this really began my exploration of motivation and emotion in science learning. And this led to the cognitive reconstruction of knowledge model, which Jan Dole and I developed. And in this model, we looked at the learner's existing conception, the strength, coherence, and, and commitment of learners to their original ideas. We also looked at their motivation for whether to hold on to or change their thinking. Important constructs in there were the, the social context and whether it was personally relevant. We looked at message characteristics, whether the message was coherent and comprehensible, and whether the information was found to be plausible. That's something we've done a lot more work on, and you'll hear about that. The learner characteristics and the message characteristics we hypothesized interacted to come to some certain level of engagement. And if that engagement was high enough, you might get conceptual change strong, meaning it would stick around. If it was too low, you would li likely get weak or no conceptual change. 
Well, I spent the next 10 years researching the CRKM and we looked at warm change, meaning things like values, goals, beliefs, self-efficacy, interests and emotions, epistemic motives on what we thought was hot topics like climate change and evolution. We also looked at the intricate interaction between learners' conceptual knowledge, whether it was accurate or inaccurate, and their attitudes, whether they be pro or con. Vivian Saranian and I proposed this two by two framework where we looked at four different profiles of learners. And through that framework, we have come to explore the relationship between knowledge and attitudes and to consider how important they are in the conceptual change process. So there were a lot of studies um, on the CRKM, and these are some of those. These are just illustrative of a, a lot of studies we did, and I include these to show you that so many of these studies were led by my colleagues and my students and former students, and I'm really proud of that. But it was this 2011 meeting that I attended on public understanding and public engagement with science. It was funded by the German Research Foundation and the US NSF. It was organized by a steering committee from both countries, Susan Goldman, Rainer Brom, other people were involved. It was held near the UN in New York City and it was a small interdisciplinary group. It was a fabulous convening and a special issue of educational psychologists resulted and we published an article in there, Barbara Hofer and I with our colleague, um, Dorte Kainhus, on public understanding of science. Well, Barbara and I continued on that work and we went further with this piece in policy insights from behavioral and brain sciences. What we went further with is explaining like, how might you enhance public understanding of science? And we said you need to overcome misconceptions, understand the nature of science, weigh uncertainty, examine who to trust, evaluate competing knowledge claims, leverage motivations, emotions, conflict, conflicting beliefs, and support positive attitudes. And these topics are what ended up forming the basis for the new volume that we've co-authored. But why does public understanding of science matter? This is a photograph of the beach border between two counties in Florida just this April. And these two counties had different stay at home policies. And this just perfectly illustrates why public understanding of science matters, because it matters to how people think about the science and enact it into policy and actions that influence everyone's everyday lives. So here's the upcoming volume. Uh, it's forthcoming from Oxford University Press. Our tentative title is Science Denial, Why It Happens and What to Do About It. And if you look at the chapters, you will see a very close alignment to those topics from our earlier articles together. We start out in the book talking about the value and limitation of scientific knowledge. Democratic societies depend on citizens to make informed decisions about scientific issues for the good of their health and well being, their communities, the nation, the planet. And we know that these issues include vaccinations, climate change, fracking, stem cell research, GMOs. And these are challenging to evaluate these scientific claims and understand the premises under the science. And so there ends up being a disconnect between what scientists know and what the general public understands. And unfortunately, this can be exacerbated by science communications when those communications try to emphasize balanced reporting. This results in confusion, especially when issues that have been fairly well resolved, such as human causes of climate change, are set up as a either or. What happens is there's a disproportionate visibility given to science denialists. And that exploits the uncertainty in science and leads to what Oreskes and colleagues called 
manufactured doubt. And here you see very well how public perceptions on global warming align much more with media coverage than they do with scientific evidence. And that's why it's so perceived by the public to be a debate, even though among scientists, um, the debates on, are, are much more uh, nuanced issues. So is there a scientific literacy crisis? Well, we always need to improve science education, of course, but it's not a matter of just increasing content knowledge. And science literacy is much more than just knowledge of science content. The Next Generation Science Standards emphasizes not only what scientists know, but how they know it. The origins, the production, and the validation of scientific knowledge, and including the limitations of science. But science denial is hardly new. And yet it is amplified in our digital social space with through social media, the spread of information, misinformation and disinformation. And online sources of scientific information can be so difficult to assess for validity, accuracy and bias and Doug Lombardi and I recently wrote about this in educational psychologists. It's really, really hard to evaluate the evidence and judge the plausibility. So how do individuals decide what knowledge to accept is valid? It's unfortunately more likely that they will believe science articles posted by friends on Facebook than from science experts. We're seeing a lot of that recently. And we all live in these social media bubbles that reinforce our own ways of thinking. This results in an erosion of trust in expertise. We also talk in the book about our own thinking and reasoning biases. So sometimes we are too reliant on system one or heuristic processing instead of system two, more deliberative processing. Things like the confirmation bias and the availability heuristic can contribute to how we process scientific information as illustrated here uh, by the Senator from the great state of Oklahoma trying to illustrate that there isn't any climate change because it was a recent large snowstorm unexpectedly in Washington, DC. That just illustrates availability. We're thinking about it and we believe it's more important than it is. It is difficult, however, to change public opinion on controversial issues. And I've argued it takes kind of a hat trick of change, meaning there's three types of change that are linked and they're really difficult to achieve for controversial topics. You have to overcome misconceptions. You have to shift the valence of both attitudes and emotions. And sometimes you have to change one's thinking about the nature of knowledge or nature of science, what we call epistemic conceptual change. We've tried to do that in a number of studies. And one way we've tried to do that is with refutation texts. Refutation texts have a three part structure. You state the misconception, refute it, and explain the scientifically valid position. Here's a piece of text developed by Ben Hetty for a study we did on refutation texts to shift attitudes about and knowledge about GMFs. It reads, you may think that genetically modified foods is essentially the same process as cloning. This is not correct. Cloning involves an exact genetic replica. We have an NSF funded refutation text meta analysis grant right now to explore the effectiveness of refutation text. This is with my colleagues, Erica Patal and Neil Jacobson from USC and Asola Edisope and Robert Danielson from Washington State. Because it's important to figure out when do these texts work and under what conditions. Ben Hetty and um, my colleagues also explored these misconceptions about GMOs further. We looked at the emotions and attitudes towards GMFs and we found that the rough text not only 
resulted in a reduction of misconceptions. It also reduced negative emotions. And this is important due to the link between negative emotions and negative attitudes. So overall, we saw a reduction in misconceptions and negative emotions, and we saw a shift in attitudinal valence as well. We've also tried to make refutation texts persuasive. In this study with Ian Thacker and my colleagues, Kristen Muse, Reinhard Peckrin, and others, we took a refutation text and we paired it with persuasive information. And this persuaded individuals to go more towards adopting a positive or negative attitude through emphasizing the pros and cons of a controversial subject. This was done with a group of undergraduates in three countries. We measured knowledge, attitudes, and epistemic emotions, and we manipulated whether the refutational text came with pro, con, or both pro and con persuasive information. And then we post-tested on the same measures. And what we found that the pro persuasive refutational text really worked out the best. Um, it had much better um, shifts in attitudes towards uh, understanding uh, GMFs and also had greater shifts in knowledge, particularly over the context, the text that included negative attitudinal persuasive information. But what about backfire effects? Can't refutation texts backfire? My colleagues, Neil Jacobson, Ian Thacker, and I are exploring that. And remember what a backfire effect is. It's the ironic strengthening or intensification of an original belief in misinformation that is the subject of an attempted correction. That's Lewandowski's definition. In this study, we recruited adult participants from an MTurk sample across the United States. We tested knowledge, attitudes, and epistemic emotions. And then we manipulated the refutation text in terms of the, uh, the type and amount of explanatory information, because we thought we might get less backfire if we had more explanations of the scientific information. And then we post-tested people. And our findings were that all groups learned from the refutation text from pre to post, and a lot of those findings held at delay, which is really important. In other words, it stuck. We also found that attitudes about GMFs improved, but most interestingly for us is 14% of the sample backfired, which really isn't that large. And unfortunately in this study, no differences in the backfire conditions uh, related to the degree of explanation, but they were very short texts and we intend to replicate this with longer texts because we still want to make sure whether enhancing explanations can further reduce the backfire effect. Moving on to another important resistor in social um, identity is social identity. So for example, Anne, Kim, Vivian, and Sarandian and I have looked at the role of group membership influences on views of science, how individuals conform to the attitudes, norms, and behaviors of their group. We have also explored how in-group messages are more persuasive than the same messages from outsiders. We've explored how sense of self is tied up with social identity. So how does this relate to public understanding of science? Well, for example, people who identify, say, with a mother's group who questions the safety of vaccinations and advocates for slow or selective vaccination schedules, or conservative media viewers who reject warnings about social gathering risks or mask wearing during a pandemic, those groups tend to influence how people who identify as part of those groups may think. Another incredibly important topic we've explored extensively in our own research is epistemic cognition, or how individuals think and reason about knowledge and knowing, and how they apply those beliefs to learning about science. Barbara Hofer, of course, has done extensive research in this area, 
looking at questions about what is knowledge, how do we know what we know, what are the sources of knowledge and why, um, and th its importance in weighing competing truth claims and deciding what authorities to trust. And this all influences science understanding. Doug Lombardi has done extensive work on this within his MEL project. So here's an example of Doug's early work on the model evidence link diagram. And that was originally developed by Clark Chin and colleagues. But in this study together, we were looking at critical evaluation and how it might promote higher quality plausibility judgments through the coordination of theory and evidence in a controlled manner. And we thought, oh, this would provide high metacognitive engagement. Doug did this study in middle school, um, in a very diverse um, location of schools and classrooms with Earth Study students. And pre and post administration of uh, the assessments, students received either their regular curriculum answering questions about climate change, evidence and predictions, or they received a treatment, which was the climate change model evidence link diagram and an explanatory instructional activity. The model evidence link diagram or MEL, again, originally developed by Clark Chin, was adapted for this study. And in this study, students take the evidences, four pieces of evidence, and they determine the relationship between the evidence and these two models. One, model A, being the scientifically correct model, the other, model B, being a skeptic model. And they have to decide whether the evidences support, strongly support, contradict, or don't have anything to do with the model. They also rated their plausibility, judgments of each model, and which they thought was more correct. And our findings were that students who received the treatment, the maltreatment, um, rated the correct model, scientific model, as more correct and more plausible compared to the treatment group. We also showed that they had a much greater degree of conceptual change and that they changed their conceptions about humans being a causal factor in climate change. They also reduced their misconceptions about skeptic causes of climate change, such as the sun's energy or orbital changes. Moving on to the topic of interest and emotions, we know how important that is in learning science. And I don't have time to describe today the speedometry project, but this was an extensive project. And I encourage you to look up the website where we have curriculum materials. And what we did here is we captured students' interest and emotions through play and created wonderful science lessons using Hot Wheels Cars and Tracks. And this is all free and available in a couple of different languages on this website. And that brings us to my current project, TAR AR, bringing the past to life in place-based augmented reality science learning. We are building an AR exhibit at La Brea Tar Pits and Museum in Los Angeles. And we're looking at whether AR technology facilitates learning of science content, what's the role of those interests and emotions we talked about in science learning, are they really interested in the science or just the cool technology? Anything surprised students? I mean, participants? And did they shift their knowledge? And here's me dorking out at La Brea on the AR. We just completed a full scale randomized control trial right before shutdown, where we compared a headset and handheld um, method of delivering the AR with two types of interactivity high and low. We're analyzing that data now on something we call the pit 91 experience. This is where participants see a virtual bubbling pit of asphalt and they get to discover fossil, fossils in the tar and they send them virtually to the lab to be identified. And what the fossils help them understand 
is the ice age environment of Los Angeles. So what we know is that AR increased their scientific knowledge. Here's one of our low poly saber tooth cat models. We hope that captures interest and creates emotions in you as you watch our cat. And we do see that people are more interested in the science content our findings reveal than in the AR technology itself. And we do see that the interest actually is positively associated with their knowledge scores. So rather than just talk about these issues in our book, we call to action. And we have action steps included in the final chapter, um, in each chapter actually, but they come together in the final chapter. And these action steps are for individuals, educators, policymakers, and science communicators. So we talk about what individuals can do. They can cultivate a scientific attitude and nurture it in others. They can improve their searching skills when they search for scientific information online. We can each be aware of our own cognitive biases and the motivations in our own reasoning. We can each think more critically about what we read, especially before we share it with others. We can vote for and value and support funding science. What can educators do? Educators can enhance their own science understanding. They can teach about the nature of science, foster scientific thinking in all of their students. They can teach real world applications of science, which are so important. Let students have choice, capitalize on that in their different areas of inquiry. And be cognizant of their strong beliefs, attitudes, and identities. Recognize their emotions. Foster more digital literacy. What can po policymakers do? They can help make the argument for funding educational research, particularly on thinking and learning. They can support standards that emphasize how to think over what to think. They can support the development of these more malleable psychological skills and development through policies like the social emotional learning that's going on in many school districts. They can push back on the current trend of ignoring factual basis for claims and they can demand more rigorous teacher preparation standards. We also talk about what science communicators can do. They are the ones on the front lines writing about science for the general public and we encourage them to continue to do that and to do it more. They can also write about how scientists know as much as what they know. It's so important as writers know to know your audience and know those misconceptions, motivations, attitudes, emotions and identities that are going to impact how they receive your communication message. Provide the evidence for the scientific claims you write about, not just the claim. And remember that both sides is for opinions, not necessarily for science. I want to thank my recent collaborators. This is just some of them. Of course, there's many others, but these particular individuals contributed to the research I shared with you today. Many of my current and former postdocs and students' research is featured in the volume and in this talk. Of course, there's many fa faculty collaborators, uh, only a few of which are listed here that have contributed to this particular talk and our book. You all rock, thank you. These are some of my favorite people in the world and I'm just sharing that because I wanted to and because they're such great collaborators and contributors to the work I shared with you here today. And I'd like to close by talking about the lessons. If you go back to the beginning of the talk where I transitioned from one thing to another to another, I kind of call myself an accidental academic. So are there lessons from my career and what I've done that you might take away? Well, this is a wordle on, on the slide that shows all my different collaborators and the different things I've done. And I think what it shows is you should follow your passion because that's kind of what I did and it worked for me and I recommend that. You need to be open to chance opportunities. I've taken a lot of those. 
They won't all pay out, pay off, but some of them will. Keep your perspectives broad. I definitely recommend collaborating as much as possible. My collaborators have made my work so much stronger. Be who you are, not who people tell you to be. Fortunately, academia is becoming more open to us being who we are. There's more than one way to make an impact, and you don't have to make it in traditional ways anymore. You can make it in different ways. Find great mentors. I've had the best mentors in the world. And don't wait to be invited to the party. Crush the party. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. I hope I get the chance to talk to you in person again soon and to answer some of your questions about this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Gail, that was wonderful. Thanks. So I, I just wanna share that Doug Lombardi is crying. Oh, Doug. I hope it's happy tears. <laughs> and we have a question from the group. Um, somebody was asking if you could describe any similarities that you might identify in that group that backfired. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, Neil Jacobson, Ian Thacker, and I are investigating that right now. We've been <clears throat> looking at cluster analyses as an example of how we might uh, suss that out. But uh, we certainly are looking at things like uh, their political affiliations. And um, we are also looking at uh, how the emotions were experienced one of the strongest things we found is that the emotions were experienced differently among the different groups. And so I look forward to sharing that article with you, which is impressed very soon in discourse processes. So we'll be able to articulate the answer to that question more fully in that piece. That's wonderful. Karen Harris wants to know, what are you looking forward to doing next? I'm looking forward to holding that darn book in my hands. And uh, Karen could appreciate that as someone who's published many, many, many more books um, than I have. Okay, I'm reading the chat, but since you said that, I, I wanted to tell a story when I was introducing you, but then I, I thought, no, you have enough time. But the first time I met you, you had your book in your hand, which was the, the book- the Conceptual book, Change with? Conceptual Change with Paul Pintridge. Yeah. And you were so excited. I didn't even know you. Like I was just kind of watching you from the periphery. You were so <laughs> excited. Complete and I have kept that in my mind ever since, because a lot of times in academia, it's like, oh, yeah, it's my book, and we're, we, we can't celebrate it. And I'm like, no, she was proud, and she was happy, and she practically was dancing about it. And that's the way I feel when I get something done, too. So thank you for letting me see that we can be that way when our work is good or done. Oh, absolutely. You should be excited about um that kind of contribution because it takes a lot of work as you know having published your own book um it it takes a lot of work and it's been a great experience i have to shout out again my co-author barbara hofer um this book wouldn't exist without our collaboration and uh her contributions it's a completely 50 50 project and um, it's amazing to work with her Can you talk about the role of social affiliation in the attitude effects you find, both large scale political affiliation and small scale? My friends believe this too. Yeah, Alex, it's a really good question. So we definitely see that people are more persuaded by their social group affiliation. And my work with Ann Kim and Vivian Saranian on, on group identity, I think relates to that. But you're certainly more persuaded by groups in, in um, your uh, immediate um, area. So I think we're seeing this play out in a, in a horrific way right now with mask wearing. So if your people and your friends and your social circles are wearing masks and they're putting pictures of themselves on social media wearing masks, then you're like, oh, okay, we can wear masks and you wear masks. Conversely, if people are doing the opposite, if they're ridiculing or um, dissing people who wear masks, uh, then you kind of get the impression, oh, mask wearing is so not cool, and then you don't want to do it. And we're seeing this play out right now to literally grave effect as people um, are, are dying. Um, and that's a really difficult example, but it is true that our social groups um, are very 
influential in how we interpret um, scientific evidence. Keep coming with those questions, people. Otherwise, Gail and I are gonna just start gossiping. What advice do you have for journalists as they publicize controversial science topics? That's a good one, I'm, Jeff Green. I'm really glad you asked that question, Jeff. We do have a section in the book, as I mentioned in the talk about um, public understanding of science and uh, for journalists and what they can do. And, and um, mostly they do wonderful, wonderful jobs. But uh, the, the big issue is, um, you know, the balance that they're, you know, <laughs> they want so, so uh, much to be fair, but in science, um, you, you know, it's, it's not a matter of being fair, it's a matter of fairly portraying the evidence. And so you don't necessarily have to have two people on, you know, one that says, you know, that climate change is, you know, being uh, made worse by human activity and one that says it's not, because that isn't reflective of the scientific evidence. Another big thing, of course, is um, the clickbait headlines. One of the things that the backfire effect research shows is that you don't want to put the misconception itself in the headline. And people like to do that because it's great clickbait. And so the reason you don't want to do that is repeated exposure to the misconception can reinforce the misconception, which of course creates this backfire. So um, the third thing I want to say about what journalists can do better is use Doug Lombardi's work <laughs> to explain, uh, you know, the evidence and what the evidence means and to uh, support people's understanding of the finding, not just saying the finding, because um, it's really hard to understand some of these scientific findings, but it's um, better to, to reinforce the actual evidence itself and how people can evaluate that and, and then make that plausibility judgment. Mm -hmm. And Ellen Wigfield asks, do you think there will be a tipping point where people who discount wearing masks, et cetera, will start to pay attention to science and believe the findings? Will it have to be personal experiences? It doesn't have to be personal experiences. It could be the case if we had more people demonstrably wearing masks from different groups it would help a lot if our president consistently wore a mask. It would help a lot if governors uh, in a highly impacted states would wear masks. It would help a lot if um, people across political spectrums and also different um, celebrities and people in different areas, sports figures. It would help if everyone um, got on that page because identities, you have many identities and it's, it's important to see somebody that you know and you can identify with um, mask wearing. So it doesn't have to be someone that you know um, becoming ill or um, unfortunately passing away due to COVID. It could be just that you start to see your social circle um, start to do it. And that would make a huge uh, difference. And people are more persuaded by somebody who's an in-group member than an out-group member. I'm curious about this extra piece here about these personal experiences and how persuasive they are. You know, my brother was in a terrible car accident and had he been wearing his seatbelt, he would have been killed. It was freak. But for year, many years after, none of us wore our seatbelts. I know it's not right, but, um, but that personal experience, how does that play into some of these deeper beliefs about things? Yes, absolutely. You know, obviously personal experience is really important. The problem with personal experience is what you just described. Um, it's an N of one and it could be an off, um, you know, situation. And so 99% of the time, it's probably better to be wearing the seatbelt. And so that's the problem with personal experience is it isn't uh, grounded enough in the scientific evidence. And so, um, there's a, there's, there's a lot of reasons why personal experience is relevant and important, but in science, often our personal experience is not only just the one-off, but it also is um, not grounded in the science. A great book by my colleague, Andrew Stillman, Science Blind, talks about how there's so many scientific conceptions that run counter to our personal experience. And so relying on your personal experience can really um, make you come to inter inappropriate and incorrect conclusions. 
So Avi's picking up on this point and then we'll come back to Lisa's question. So Avi says, related to personal experience, how does your work on epistemic change regarding science might relate to other domains of knowledge, social relationships, for example? Do you find that you are applying these strategies across your life domains? Um, I'm, I, I don't know. That's a really good question, Avi. I think one of the reasons why um, it works well in the science domain for the topics we explore is because we know, we know the um, correct answer. We know the scientifically most viable explanation. And we can um, use our understanding of the epistemology of science to, to support that. I think when it comes to um, other domains, it depends on whether that information is actually, you know, solid. Um, because if it's not, then I think it's a, it's a different thing. We might be talking about persuasion. For example, um, misconceptions about race and racism is something that would be interesting to explore using the frameworks of conceptual change because there are some clear misconceptions, but then if it uh, changes into an issue of people's feelings and opinions that aren't grounded well in science, then it would be, I think, more of a persuasion situation rather than a conceptual change situation. Great. And Lisa asks, do you have any insight into how we as a field could systematically help others develop good scientific theory with so many different information sources, many novices struggle with this skill? Yes. So the article that Doug Lombardi and I just wrote in Educational Psychologist, which if you don't have access to, you can just write to either Doug or I, and we will share a copy of that article with you. We talk about that very thing, how difficult it is to source information uh, correctly and to figure out uh, what's reliable. And we have some tips in there for how to do a better job at it. There's also some excellent work by Jeff Green and um, also, of course, um, um, Ivar Broughton, extensive work and in, uh, by other scholars on how to source information more reliably. There's also the News Literacy Project that helps people understand how to um, you know, evaluate something. I think the biggest thing I could say is um, stop sharing articles you haven't read. <laughs> We've all done it. We click on some something and you see just maybe the headline and two lines about the article and then you share it. D don't, don't do that. <laughs> I have to stop myself from doing that because I've done it a few times myself. You should open the article. You should evaluate it. You should compare it to other information. And only if you've decided that you feel it's really some strong evidence should you share it. Um, don't share things because they're wrong and you want to show people how wrong they are because then you are reinforcing uh, the incorrect information. The um, video pandemic, which had um, extensive misinformation about coronavirus, was shared over 9 million times on Facebook. And some of the misconceptions you see people have right now um, come directly out of that video. So don't be sharing things that you haven't fully vetted yourself um, because you might be sharing misinformation. I'm sorry. And I wonder too, like, just with this, how do we learn these skills? How much of it is reliant on um, knowledge, actually understanding the science that you're reading about? Well, I'm never gonna argue that more knowledge is not a good thing, um, but if you don't know the information in the article, there's ways to check it. You know, there's other, other you can call up other information, you can search for other information online. You know, there's ways to check your understanding, even if you aren't familiar with the topic. Um, we're probably all learning a lot more about vi vir virology than we ever <laughs> wanted to know um, prior to this current pandemic. And so we probably had very little knowledge at the beginning about the spread uh, of infection. And, and we're learning just as everyone else. Uh, the key is to learn what you can and not to share things that you haven't vetted. And Ananya is asking, how can science-based decision-making be implemented more organizationally, institutionally, national policy-wise? Does every level need uh, science experts to disseminate information for the group? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the next generation science standards um, are a great beginning because they emphasize teaching people about how to do science and 
and how to evaluate it themselves. And that's really what you need because of course all the scientific information is changing all the time. And so just teaching facts about science of course isn't the way to go and, and teaching people how to evaluate information and scientific information is what we need to do more of. Um, the NGSS standards can, can do that. I think Doug's talk, if you were here to see his SNOW Award address earlier, um, gave you extensive information about how they are teaching multiple different topics um, uh, and having students evaluate evidence. I think we need to do a lot more of that um, to help people understand how to evaluate evidence as opposed to just understanding what scientists know, more emphasis on how scientists know what they know and have, have the skills to then evaluate information you know, for yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, Brandon, whose name I can no longer see anymore, asks, in terms of conceptual change, is there any data regarding potential pushback from family or societal factors and the effect oh, it's moving <laughs> that has on student acceptance of scientific information or the other way around? Does conceptual change in students help promote conceptual change in home or community in general? Um, yes, it's both, Brandon. So we have research that shows that um, students, particularly with evolution and sometimes with climate change, uh, get pushback from their family or even feel that their um, identities are at threat if they accept the scientific definitions um, in evolution that suggests that all, all life on Earth is, is related. That's disturbing to some individuals and then that creates a tension for them in their home environment. On the more positive side though, we've seen that um, young climate activists have been uh, very influential in convincing their parents that climate change is something that is uh, happening and is important for them to pay attention to. Young uh, people can also influence their parents on understanding science. Um, I think Ben Hetty's work on, on adolescent uh, girls, science learning would be a good place to turn for that. They not only learn more science themselves, but they ended up teaching their parents some science. So it can leverage both ways. It can be a challenge for students learning science as they interact with family members with different beliefs, but they can also be influential, influential in shifting family members' beliefs as well. Okay. And Jeff is taking us to, <coughs> you've been such a productive scholar. I think that's an understatement. Uh, do you have any advice for scholars who sometimes feel stuck, particularly during difficult times like these when there are so many other things on people's mind? I'm not sure I've been as productive as you, Jeff, but I'll, I'll take that one. Thank you. Um, yeah, work with amazing students. If you notice, um, my work is driven uh, in part by my students' interests. Um, my students get interested in something and push me to become more interested in it. Um, I didn't know anything about climate change until I met Doug Lombardi. Um, you know, uh, Ian Thacker's got me interested in misconceptions about math. Uh, Neil Jacobson's got me interested in the backfire effect. Um, I'm working with Imogen Herrick on understanding science teachers and I could keep going, but all of my students have, um, and postdoc have pushed me to new areas new ideas and that's how I've never gotten bored and never run out of ideas. <laughs> oh, Helen Rose, please tell Gail that oh. Bridge would have loved All right, her. Helen, you're gonna try to make me cry in the middle of this now? We thought only Doug was crying. Um, wow, that's, um, that's very moving. Thank you. I'll try not to lose it here now, but thank you. I think about him every day. And then to have just lost Stuart. So shout out to uh, friends and family of Stuart Karabenik. I was devastated uh, to hear about his passing because Stuart was a very special person to all of our um, Ed Psych and Motivation community mm -hmm. and um, kind of jumped into uh, deep friendship with him after Paul's passing. He was there for me, so I really appreciated Stuart. <coughs> Can you hear the cops? They're coming for me. Sorry. So uh, we have like four minutes left, Gail. Any, anything you just want to share with the Division 15 community, either 
as scholars or as service to this community or where we should go? Yeah, I want to echo Doug's earlier remark that everyone in the division has very important work to do to contribute to current situations, both with the misunderstanding of science situation we have with COVID and with our you know, racial reckoning that the country is um, experiencing. Um, when you think about the work that we do, I work on identity, um, thinking of obvious work, I'm thinking about the work on race and understanding um, Jamal Matthews work that he was sharing with us in his discussion remarks yesterday. I could keep going. All of us in Division 15 do extremely important and relevant work to the issues of our day. And I think if you can continue to do that work and also to try to communicate that work to the general public. So our book, uh, Barbara, my book, we have tried very hard to make it accessible. We hope it will be accessible to teachers, um, maybe politicians, <laughs> people who are outside of educational psychology because we believe in the relevance of this work for broader issues. But your work, members of the division, is extremely relevant as well. So write for your journals because you need to do that to share the, into the scientific community. But please also write op-eds. Please also write um, blogs. Please also um, be on Twitter. Please also share your work with teachers and policy makers because it's important work and it's uh, what we need right now. And I'm very proud of the work of the division that Helen Rose has so expertly carried forward in regards to pushing our policy and practice agenda forward for everyone to appreciate the relevance of the work of our members. And um, I'm super excited that we are continuing to make inroads on in that. So we have many people now saying how wonderful you are. Um, well, then let me take a moment to say how wonderful you have been. This is amazing that you um, and the program committee had to shift at this last minute to this format. Um, I know these formats are perfect and we are learning how to do them. So appreciate our members' patience with some of the glitches and bugs. I hope we don't get better at them because that means we're doing more of them. I hope we don't <laughs> have to get better at them. I hope we'll be back to meeting uh, each other in person so that we can raise a glass um, in person. But under extraordinary circumstance, you did an amazing job thanks, thanks to you and your program committee. Well, my program pan media is amazing. And I just need to correct, Ellen Usher just said this was our last session together. That is not the case. We have a social hour coming. We you do. Those glasses. I know Wade put it in the chat earlier. There are, I think, five different discussion rooms. I'm posting one. Happy to come join me. Go talk to Gaya. Oh, here it is again. Um, learn how to make a gimlet with Doug, Lo Doug Lombardi. Uh, I can't remember. Talk yeah, about travel with gimlet. Nicole and Jamal. Um, Michelle Buell and Sharon Nichols, our incoming leadership, are hosting some kind of Pictionary game. Um, there are others. Oh, Avi's doing one. I forget the topic. So, you know, come in, drop in. You're allowed to jump from room to room, just like you were at a real social. And uh, Jeff Green taught me, I think yesterday or the day before, the polite way to get out of a room is just, you know, in the chat say, nice to see you, gotta go. It's like you're walking back away from people over to the bar, which I have set up because I am ready to make a gimlet with Doug, with Doug Lombardi. In. I like your swag back there. Thanks for the swag, Wade. I got mine yesterday. I was super excited about it. I can't even tell you. So I think, <laughs> so those socials start in like five minutes. So well, grab we your cocktail. Go, get ready for their social. They need to go get their cocktail. Yeah. I know what I do. Now I got to put my wig on. So thank you everyone for attending on a Saturday afternoon. That's amazing. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Gail.